Yeah. 
worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, worship your holy name.
jealous for me. But love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. And all of a sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory. Realize just how beautiful you are and great your affections are for me. Oh, sit in this for a second. Sit in the moment where we remember, we remember what God's love looks like for us. Not just burn through a psalm, but let's sit for a second. What has it looked like to you this week? We have a tendency to, to run towards things that don't work. We have a tendency to Spirit, come and do what you do best. And cause your people to remember. Let this be a holy moment. Spirit of God, send out your love. And restore what is broken. That you would shift even the neural pathways and the feelings of the heart and the mind. And we would be like a bunch of children enjoying your presence. Enjoy love. By the Father and loving back. That's okay. Receive it. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. You are so loved. He loves you. He loves you. He pursues you. You are not alone. You will never be alone. We are yours and you are mine. We are yours.
Father, thank you so much. Hmm. We just sit here just all day, God, feeling your love. Just feeling the release of your presence, God. And catching your heart for us, God. The goodness and the greatness of your affection for us. thinking during this song that I used to um, I've been a Christian for a long time but I haven't always known the love of the Father right just because you're saved doesn't mean you know how much he loves you and doesn't mean you know how crazy he is about you and I used to come to church and I was like so stressed out because I was like oh what if he finds out like what I'm really like you know he knows right he already knows and it doesn't change anything he just loves you so much and this song is such a, a powerful passionate reminder of, the, of God's great heart for you and the way that he displays it. And um, I just want to release, just as an extension of this song that we'd be doing, just release that heart that God has for you, that you would have that, if you haven't had that moment, that change moment where you shift from anxiety about what God thinks about you to peace, knowing how much he loves you and knowing how much he cares for you, I just want to release that. So God, we just ask that in this moment you would shift hearts. God, that you would take us from a works-based relationship with you into a love-based relationship with you. And God, that any place that we're working for your affection, God, that you would just radically come in and give us your affection and that we would know we get that freely and that we don't have to do another thing to earn your love, to earn your favor, to earn your affection. God, would you just shift our mindsets this morning? <laughs> You're so good, God. You're so faithful. You're so transformational. And God, I thank you that this is, what you're doing here is transformational. And that we can freely receive from you this morning. And so God, we bless you and we bless what you're doing. We love you so much, Father. Amen. Whew. I don't know if anybody else is feeling that, but I can feel it right here. You guys, it's, it is offering time. We're going to ask those ushers to come forward, and if you need a, an envelope or if you need a bulletin so that you can pull, um, write your prayer request, we're going to do that. Uh, I think Tracy has a special song for us this morning, which is always awesome. And um, don't forget that we want your testimonies and we want your prayer requests, and putting those in the offering basket is the perfect place to put those. So just put your hand up if you need an envelope or if you need a pen or anything from one of our ushers. I've done this song one other time for offering, but this is a, a Hebrew song that we sing a lot at uh, As One Services. It's really powerful. It's really ministered to me, so I just invite you to sing along, even if you don't know Hebrew. <laughs> and uh, we'll also be singing it in English. Yeshua Ayaka.
Why don't you give the band Tracy a hand? Thank you guys so much. Oh, we're, we are a little bit spoiled, I think, with our worship. We are so fortunate. Thanks, you guys. Good morning. Happy post-Easter Sunday. I don't know if there's is it anything special post-Easter. Just this morning makes it special. He is still risen. That's what's special about it, right? He is still not in the tomb. Listen, anybody new this morning? This is your first time with us? Oh, welcome, welcome. Anybody else? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, we, we, our ushers have a packet of information for you that we would love to give to you. And if you want to fill out that little contact card so we can follow up with you, we will trade it in. Um, we will put a Starbucks card in your hand in exchange for that. So we are not above bribing you with Starbucks <laughs> to stay connected. We value community that much, right? You know what, why don't you turn around and greet somebody, say hi to somebody, make a new friend. If you have somebody that raised their hand and they are new, introduce yourself. We don't want anybody to leave here without a new friend.
while you're saying hi, turn around and say hi to everybody who's watching online. We love that you join us every Sunday. Get your hellos on. All right. Well, I have a couple announcements for you all this morning. A couple good announcements for you. Hey, we've got some great small groups that we want you to get plugged into. We've got the Venice Wednesday Night Home Group. I'm actually speaking this week at the Venice Home Group. So if you're you attend the Venice Home Group, I will see you on Wednesday night. Malibu Tuesday night home group, both of those meet at seven. All kinds of information about those. This is really exciting. We are doing a women's spring tea gathering. I cannot wait. This is so great. Mother's Day weekend, May 10th, 11 a.m. to 2. This is going to be in Agora Hills. Respond. You can RSVP to that. That is in your bulletin, all the information you need about that. But we want to see you there. It's going to be really special and a great time of celebrating the women in our community and building fellowship and community. Um, and I think we probably have the As One slide. Don't forget that we are still gathering Saturday nights in North Hollywood. We're not stopping that anytime soon because God is moving on Saturday Saturdays and Saturday nights in North Hollywood. Jason's doing an incredible service, teaching, food fellowship, all the good stuff. Check your bulletin for that. And um, I think we have, we have another special song. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever walk. My faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. My faith
Take me deeper And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior So we just want to ask that when we go through the trials When we come to the waters and the deep places in our lives we want to ask that we would be like our Messiah, who in the midst of the storm was able to sleep through it. Though everything was raging around them, and the disciples became nervous, he had complete equanimity, a complete shalom, a complete peace. And he spoke to the waters, and he called them to be still. And so we thank you that although things might go around us that might be scary or intense, we thank you that you are sovereign, that your providential hand guides all of history and all of the affairs of our life. And so we thank you that through them you strengthen us and you teach us to trust. And you call us not to stay in the boat, even in the midst of the storm. You call us to have the faith and the trust to take a risk and to step out of the boat and come walking to you in the midst of the water, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the seas of our life. And in the process, we'll go further and farther than we could ever imagine by faith. So we bless your name. Do that work within our lives, in our hearts, through your Son, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Good morning, everyone. How you doing? So it was, last week was so powerful, and I was thinking about it. It's kind of like we talked about how, how God sent the Messiah, to, and he died, and in a sense, he defeated death. But he didn't defeat death just to defeat death. He defeated death that we might live. And he defeated death that we might live. And it's not just talking about the quality, quantity of years, like meaning that he comes to bring eternal life, but eternal life isn't primarily quantity of years because every soul is eternal. It's a matter of how that soul is going to spend that eternity because we have the breath of God within us. And so what he comes to bring is a quality of life. And, he, and the good news is that that quality of life, that heavenly type of life, that kingdom type of life is not a life that is meant to be lived one day when we pass from this world and enter into the world to come. The kingdom life is meant to be lived in our life right now. We're meant to experience it. And that kingdom life is meant to bring change and it's meant to bring transformation to us because if we don't have that kingdom life, we don't have that Jesus life uh, we might be alive, but we're not truly living. And there's a difference between the two. And I'm excited today because, you know, we have a, a part of our family here in this community. We're going to hear a powerful testimony that I think embodies this truth, embodies this reality. We have, in a moment, we're going to have Terry Adamson come and share with us. And Terry grew up in a, in a Jewish home, and she uh, came to know the Lord. And uh, she she's, she's, has an amazing background. She has been the commissioner at the court here in Malibu, a judge, a professor, at, and is a professor at Pepperdine in, in, the, in the law school, written several books. And in 1977, I believe, you met your husband, Grant. 70, 70, 70 what? 77. 70 what? 76. 70, okay. So I, it's all good. And, and she married Grant, and Grant was the, his great-grandparents were the founding family of Malibu. And many of you might have heard, because we've been praying for Terry, that they went through an ordeal. And, you know, many, as you'll hear, many people didn't think Terry might not even make it to be here with us today, which is an incredible story of how God worked through the situation and through the circumstances and I think it embodies that song that we just sang and the amazing grace of God and the resurrection and redeeming power of the love of Jesus. 
So Terry, would you come and, and share with us uh, what God has been doing and what he is doing in your life? So we just come and give it up for Terry. We so appreciate her. Rabbi Jason is most amazing rabbi pastor, and his hugs give so much solace and joy. I mean, there's, there's a lot of healing there, Rabbi Jason, and you've been amazing, amazing for me. Thanks. <laughs> so I am so happy to have found a church family. Uh, I hadn't found a church family before Ascend, um, and so thank you, Rabbi Jason, and thank you, Wendy Hughes and Hughes family, for bringing me here and being so incredibly supportive. And Wendy r really brought me to my journey to Christianity. I want to talk about the balloon crash and my faith in God, which has been strengthened, but I want to give you a little bit of background first. Um, I did grow up in a Jewish home, but it was culturally Jewish and religiously agnostic. Uh, so we had lots of love. We, my family still had lots of love, family and food. Um, but uh, the only time that we went uh, to services, we went twice a year on the high holidays to temple, and the services were not in English, and we never learned Hebrew. So my cousins and my siblings and I sat there and daydreamed and, you know, kind of fidgeted a lot, waiting for all the yummy food that was coming. And I knew there was something missing in my life. I have a wonderful, loving family, but I, I did feel that there was something missing. Um, uh, I married the love of my life, Grant, who um, was Christian. And we ended up sending our kids to Malibu Press Nursery School, which is a really loving place. And one thing that I noticed when I would take um, the kids uh, to nursery school was that the teachers there and the, the people that had faith there had this incredible calm about them that I did not have. <laughs> I grew up in a family with a lot of anxiety, and I've um, had a lot of anxiety uh, over the years, but I've, I've come to a place of calm. I've always been a positive person, but that's not the same as, as having serenity, and that all of you that have faith know. Um, I wished that I could have that. I looked at these people and I, en I didn't envy them in a bad way. I didn't want them not to have their faith, but I wanted it. But I just, I didn't think that was available to me. And I, and I remember saying to my husband, God, that they're so lucky because they have this incredible faith. They, they believe that when their loved ones die, they're going to see them again someday in heaven. I wish I could believe that. They believe that if they're, their teenager is driving in the canyon and they're worried because it's a rainstorm that they can pray and they'll have that solace. I wish I could have that. I didn't know it was available to me. I just thought, wow, they're so lucky to have that. Poor me, too bad. I don't have that. Um, I started believing in God when my daughter Lauren was born. Um, she's here. She's, and my kids are such a blessing. When I held her and I looked at her and I just thought, wow, there is a God. I mean, this is the most amazing, magical, incredible thing. There has to be a God for something this wonderful. And the love that you feel for your child, the second that baby is handed to you, it's just this overwhelming, unbelievable love that all of you know who are parents. Um, so, I, so I did come to have a faith in God, but it wasn't defined. It wasn't any particular religion. And... Um, then Wendy started doing Bible study with me, and I started learning the teachings of Jesus and just thinking, this is so beautiful, and particularly the forgiveness, the, the love and the forgiveness that, that Jesus has. So I started getting this sense of calm and this ability to pray when I was worried about something, and I realized it made me feel better. Like, instead of just worrying about something there w that I couldn't do anything about, I actually could do something about it because I could pray and I could give it over to God and put trust there, and it, and it made me feel more of a solace. So I have had this faith in God for, for many years now and been a believer in Jesus, and the, the, the music really resonated with me in church. I started finding when I went to church 
I felt this feeling there that I had never felt in Temple or anywhere else. It was it started with the music, but then just became this that I really did believe, and I felt this real calm about it. Um, the accident happened August 6th, so about eight and a half months ago, August 6th of 2013. And I did definitely have, have faith in Jesus and, and as our savior before the accident, but it's only been strengthened. Um, it was a horrible tragedy, um, but there has been miracles that have come out of it as well. Um, Grant and I were together for 37 years, married for 30, and he was amazing. Um, there was almost 700 people at his memorial, and he was an incredible person, um, an amazing husband and father. And the four of us uh, were in Switzerland. We were actually having this family vacation right around our 30th wedding anniversary. And we went up what we thought would be a lovely, scenic, uh, hot air balloon ride. And um, once we were up in the air, the four of us and the pilot, my daughter Megan, um, she was feeling scared and the, the pilot was acting erratic. Um, my husband and I had done a hot air balloon ride before. It was very peaceful and we certainly were not do, doing any activity that we thought would possibly be putting our children in harm's way or ourselves. Um, but the Right from the beginning, the pilot, his behavior was concerning me. He never gave us any uh, instructions. Um, when we'd gone before, there was a lot of safety instructions. The pilot seemed really um, very professional. This one did not at all, even though he spoke English. He just he just never said a thing. We were up really high, and then the, the, we were higher than lower, and it was changing, and I... Megan was very scared. I started feeling that this was not a safe situation. And I said to the pilot, um, we don't feel safe. And he laughed. He just started laughing. Then I knew we were really in trouble. So I don't remember exactly what happened with the crash because um, we, got, we all went unconscious and I was in a coma, according to medical reports for three days. And um, I do remember, though, feeling very worried about this. And I remember Megan was crying, and we were comforting each other. Once he started laughing, I knew that this was a dangerous situation. So I know I was praying, and I remember that we were comforting each other. Megan was in the middle, and Lauren, my older daughter, was hugging around Megan, and I was hugging around Lauren and Megan and my husband, Grant who's the protector, everyone who knew him, Wayne's very close friend, knows that he was, he was gonna protect his family no matter what. I mean, this is the kind of person that he was. And as much as Grant really loved life and really wanted to live, I know that if he could have chosen one way that he had to die, if there was like one way of the list, it would have been protecting his family and saving our lives if that was his choice. And, and, that, and I'm convinced that is a choice that he made. He was hugging us from the outside. Um, the balloon um, crashed into power lines, which is the most dangerous thing that can happen with a hot air balloon ride. Um, and I don't know, like I said, know exactly what happened, but I believe that Grant buffered us with his, just with his physicality in whatever way he could. He protected us. Um, the medical report said he was instantly killed. Uh, the three of us were extremely seriously injured. They did not know if we would live, um, particularly B, um, but we all, I was in the hospital for two and a half months. My daughter Lauren had 10 surgeries. I'm told I had around 12. I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, my daughter Megan's spine was crushed so badly that she lost an inch and a half of height. Fortunately, she was 5'10". <laughs> but um, <laughs> she, uh, she had a 14-hour spine surgery that was um, very you know, scary and touch and go. And um, my daughter Lauren researched hot air balloon crashes afterward and found out that typically when a hot air balloon hits a power line, everyone dies. 
because the balloon usually goes on fire. So it's a horrible way to go to, I'm, I'm sure, not fast. Um, we hit at a height of, when we crashed, we were at a height of 165 feet. Um, I believe what happened from as best as we can construct, uh, we construct it from the, the people who were on the ground is that the balloon started to deflate and was in the process of deflating as, as we crashed down 165 feet. Um, the injuries, as I said, were really extensive. I broke my jaw in four places. My face was just smashed. The only memory I have after that had only met I told you about um, before, and before I went into a coma is I remember moaning and I remember hearing my daughters moaning. I didn't, I couldn't see them, but I heard it, which as a mom was really obviously <laughs> horrible. And I was in an incredible amount of pain and I remember spitting out teeth and spitting out blood and I, I thought all my teeth had been knocked out. Um, and they, they weren't all knocked out, but some of them were broken and, and some of them were knocked out. Anyway, um, we all suffered um, serious back injuries. We all broke our backs. And um, I had a spine injury. Um, my daughter, Lauren Leitch, had, well, we all had spine injuries. Mine caused um, a drop foot. So there's, that's, that's the main thing that's interfering with my walking right now, but I am able to walk. Thank God. <laughs> I was a big hiker before, so I'm, I'm so thankful. And anyway, I broke um, my leg and my ankle, and my, I had really serious internal bleeding. I broke my pelvis in two places, my coccyx, my, I already said my back. I'm going to move up because it's so many things. Eight, eight ribs um, and internal injuries that were very serious were my liver perforated and was bleeding out and my that was what pretty I think came in closest to almost killing me and my diaphragm separated and was floating around so those were different emergency surgeries I flatlined twice um, my heart was racing and then my heart stopped on two different uh, occasions during the, the beginning part of the hospital which was in Switzerland um, they did the epinephrine in the heart and that did not work. They brought the crash team in. They did the defibrillator. That did get the heart going. But the reason I'm standing here before you, what really, I mean, the, the, the doctors were amazing, but I truly completely believe in my heart what really made the difference is prayer. Um, and I'm convinced. I'm convinced of that. And the interesting thing is the doctors agree with that. Our doctors, it kind of, it, it surprised me. I mean, I really, because you know, they're scientists, and, but I had a lot of time to get into some uh, discussions with the doctors, particularly once we got flown back to St. John's, and I had some very interesting religious uh, and philosophical discussions with the doctors, and my doctors were all of faith. It was incredible to me. They all believed in God. Um, some were Christian, some were Jewish. They all believed in God, and they all believed that prayer made the difference. Um, they, they didn't know in the beginning if any of us were going to make it. I was very marginal uh, for a, a while. I was circling the drain. And there was a time right at the beginning when, when my heart stopped and when I was dying, and they brought a pastor in. And we had about 12 people there with us. We had a lot of friend and family support. And there was a time when I, I could feel I was dying and I was in so much incredible pain and grief from losing the love of my life, my best friend, um, that I just was like ready to go. I'm like, God, I'm ready. You know, I'm ready to go to heaven and, and be with Grant. But then I pictured my daughter's faces and I thought, I cannot give up. My daughters need me, and I'm really, really close to my daughters. They really need me. And so I thought, and I prayed, and I thought, and, and, I, and I have to tell you, I really felt the prayers. Wendy Hughes told me that um, this whole ordeal with praying for our family over the months of the healing was one of the first things as a church community here where you had like a long ordeal of, 
of praying for healing for a, for a family. And boy, did we feel those prayers, I have to tell you. Um, there was an international prayer chain. Uh, Pepperdine was involved in it. We had people praying at our bedside. We found out later about people praying all over the world. And it, it, it was incredible. I mean, I had a sense of solace. I have not had trouble sleeping since the accident. I don't have trouble sleeping. I, I really do have this faith. And I, at night, the nurses, some nurses who were very religious that would talk to me, they just said, envision Jesus' arms wrapping around you and holding you like a baby and comforting you through the night when you go to sleep. So I would do that. And the prayers, I mean, I feel them in my heart. I felt them all along. I still am feeling them. And so many people would tell me how hard they were praying for us. And I said, I know, because I, <laughs> I felt it. And, and my kids, too. So uh, to sum this up, uh, the doctors uh, call us their walking miracles. Um, none of us were expected to be able to walk. I'm back to hiking. Um, <laughs> that's really incredible, right? Um, I'm hiking on paved roads, but still counts. The top of Sierra Retreat, it's a mile round trip, and I do that almost daily. And a lot of people here in my neighborhood can attest to this. And Margie and Alicia and the Hughes of CB out there walking. Um, and my kids are both walking unaided. They're walking without a cane, without crutches. I just, when, when we started walking even with a walker, it was such a blessing, I couldn't believe it. And now I'm, I'm walking with the cane for stability. I will be getting off the cane, and I, I can walk without it. Just isn't that pretty. But, um, but I wanted to, s to close with saying that when I started coming here after the accident, I've been coming every Sunday that we've been in town, and I started coming, a lot of you remember, in a wheelchair. And the Hughes family's been bringing me every week, and I came in a wheelchair, and then after that, it was two crutches, and then it was one crutch, and now it's a cane. And it's, it's been really great, because the people, the greeters, you wonderful, warm-hearted greeters, like Trish and all of you have come, they're like, oh, Wow, you're on you you're on crutches, and wow, you're only on one crutch now, and it made me feel so good every week. And and Rabbi Jason's prayers, I mean, oh my gosh, and he just gives me these big hugs and praise. And then the prayer team, the prayer team has been incredible, really, really helping taking uh, diminishing the pain a lot. So I'm so blessed to have found a church family, and I just want to close by saying that. I know God has a purpose. I know God loves us. And obviously he wanted my kids and I to live. I, I don't think he wanted my husband to die. But I, I know that he did what he could for us to live and to heal. And he's still healing us. And my faith has never been stronger. And I just want to say that to any extent, I t like I told Rabbi Jason, that I can inspire anybody, if I can help inspire anybody to bring them to faith or to strengthen their faith or to help them pray for someone else or to be positive or be more calm, to any extent that I can do that, that's what I want to do. So. We're going to pray for you real quick. Do you think Lauren would like to or no? I just let her. She's shy. Okay. So, guys, Wendy, Wayne, whoever, Alicia, whoever, we just want to, we're going to sing, if you just play instrumentally for a moment, we're going to sing Amazing Grace in a minute, because we know mm -hmm. Terry loves this song, and this is an, an example of amazing grace. And Kai, we say amazing grace at this memorial, and everybody was crying. <laughs> An amazing grace on two fronts, right? I mean, amazing grace that what a picture says, Paul writes, husbands love your wives as Jesus loved his church, as his body. What an example of, 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 of that of, of the no greater love than this than a person would lay down their life for a friend. That's the type of love we're called to have for him and for one another. And the grace with, with Terry and, and Lauren and Megan 
of the physical restoration that's going on. And we know that the enemy and try to take your lives because there's something important and significant, a purpose, a message that you're to share to bring hope and healing to others. And we just believe that God who began the good work is going to finish it in your lives. And so we just want to just pray right now for Terry, for, for Lauren, for Megan. We thank you that you are the God of all comfort. And we thank that you are the God of all healing. And we know that you have a hope and a future for them. And we just want to pray in the midst of the loss that you would bring your love, that you would bring your light, that you would bring your comfort, that you would bring your compassion, that there would be an accelerated healing in their body, a complete renewal, that you would make them not even as good as before, that you would make them better than before. And we ask God that what, what, what was meant for evil, that you would turn for good, that, that lives would be changed, that people would have hope restored, that faith would break forth in people's lives as a result of hearing this story, Lord. And we ask that the memory of Grant, who was such an amazing man, who was so loved and respected and was such a, such a blessing to this community and, and, to this, and to this region and beyond in so many ways, that his memory is not going to be forgotten, that it would encourage people to faith to love, to hope, and to deeds of kindness. And that people would be inspired by his life and they'd say, yes, I want to do what he did. I want to be, I want to, I want to be that type of man, that type of husband, that type of father. And so we bless them right now. And we thank you for them. And we ask complete healing. We ask God for a, for a new work in their lives and in their families. In whatever way, you, whatever way possible, Lord, restore the years. Restore the blessing. We just lift them up to you now. We thank you for them. And we bless them. In your son, Jesus, Yeshua's name. Amen. When I first met Terry, she I asked what her favorite song was. Yeah. This happened to be it, so if you would, would you sing Your life me? is a fragrance. Your story is a fragrance. Amazing grace And how sweet the sound That saved a wretch Like
thank you for your love. We ask now, God, that you would just, that that, that Terry's testimony, that what they've been through, God, would just speak to our heart. And we thank you, God, for your work of grace and transformation in our lives. And we just ask right now, as we briefly look at your word, would you open our hearts and speak to us that we might experience that greater grace in our lives. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. What an amazing story, right? You know, when we go through sufferings, suffering can either snuff out our faith or it can strengthen our faith. And what a powerful story of faith strengthened as a result of a terrible situation. And today also, uh, on, in, for Jewish people, is a significant day too because this is Yom HaShoah. This is a remembrance of the Holocaust, of the day that six million Jewish people uh, lost their lives, many of my family, as you know. And the amazing thing about it is that it comes uh, right after when we celebrate Resurrection Sunday. Because literally, both in Terry's case and in the case of the Jewish people, that it was out of the ashes of Auschwitz that God establishes the state of Israel. And it proves that God is faithful to his promise. That no matter how much pain there is, that no matter how much loss there is, God is faithful to his promises And he has the power to fulfill those promises. And just like he resurrected Jesus from the dead, just like he resurrected new faith in Terry, in the same way out of the death that the Jewish people experienced, he resurrected the nation of Israel. Because God is faithful. And his promises are true. And he won't abandon us. And he won't leave us. And he won't forsake us. And whether it be the testimony of an individual or of a nation, the love of God, the power of God, the transformative, redemptive work of God is is beyond our imagination. And I believe, as you know, as we've shared about before, that we have to learn to live with the times and the seasons that Jesus celebrated all of the Jewish holidays, and this season, biblically right now, is a significant season for a number of different reasons. But in Acts chapter 1, this is what we read. Luke, Luke writes, well, we believe Luke wrote Acts. In the, fir- in, the first, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus, Yeshua, began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive after his sufferings by, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking to them about the kingdom of God. So it's during this season right now, after the resurrection, that, that he spent 40 days teaching his disciples the meaning and the message and the mysteries of the Malkut Shemaim of the kingdom of God. And so just as he taught his disciples during this season, it's important for us to be meditating on the meaning and the message of the kingdom and the significance of these days that we're in. And it goes back to Leviticus 23, 15, where it says, you shall count, if you have your Bibles, you can open up Leviticus 23, uh, 15. It says, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So meaning on the second day of Passover, you, they brought the first fruits and waved them before the Lord as a sign of thanksgiving. So we talked about last week, Jesus rose from the dead on first fruits. He's the first fruits of, of the dead. And you shall count 50 days the day after the seventh Sabbath, then you shall present a grain offering, a new grain offering to the Lord. So there is this 50-day count from the second day of Passover when the first fruits are brought to Pentecost, to Shavuot in Hebrew. Can you say Shavuot? Shavuot. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, as, 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 a, comm- as a commemoration of leaving Egypt or after we left Egypt, we count 50 days until Sinai. You know, why did God wait 50 days until he comes down on Sinai? 
And I think part of the thing we have to understand is the goal of redemption is revelation. Jesus redeems us as he gives himself as the Passover lamb. He resurrects from the dead. But redemption is always for the sake of revelation. The one without the other is incomplete. Redemption from Egypt brought physical freedom from the burdens and the bondages of slavery. But without the revelation of God's word, our freedom would have no purpose. Redemption was essential, but it was the revelation of God and the receiving of the Ten Commandments, the Word of God, that gives life meaning and purpose. And so just like, just like it was in the days they came out of Egypt, so it was with the greater Moses, Jesus, our Messiah. But when redemption and re but between re re redemption and revelation, these, there were 49 days of preparation that were needed. There was spiritual preparation, there was spiritual purification that was going on in preparation for this special day, Pentecost, Shavuot, the same day on which the Word of God was given on Mount Sinai. It's the same day on which the Spirit of God was given because the foundation of creation is the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep as God speaks the Word, God's creative redemptive, transformative power is always released through the combination of word and spirit. So at this time, we have to understand that God is fashioning in us the potential for transformation, the potential for advancement, the, the potential for, for, for achievement. And of these 49 days, it's understood that the last three days were the most important days. Those were what we read about in Exodus uh, 19, where God says to Moses and the children of Israel, prepare yourself because on the third day, I will come down upon the mountain. And so the last three days are seen as especially important, which is again tying back to Jesus rising on the third day. And one of the things that I love, because it's one of the greatest revelation of God in history, is the resurrection. Just like Sinai was a historical revelation, millions saw the resurrection as a historical event. It's not just kind of wishful thinking. They experienced it. And the thing I love about this kind of three, and you know we love numbers here, is, is we've talked about this before, is, is redemption is connected to the number three. Three sprinklings of the blood on the doorposts of the house. A number of things in three, but Jesus' whole redemption, he's crucified at the third hour. There's three crosses. There's three hours of darkness. He's in the tomb three days. There's more, his trial is broken into two parts, three in a civil court, three in a religious court. But more than that, the third day, we think about the third day, we think about the third day of creation. What was created on the third day? The trees. The very means by which the fall came on the third day. Three days in the tomb, put on a cross, a tree, to bring resurrection and life and resurrection and restoration as the second Adam. But three, if you think three days, how many hours is that? 72 hours. 72 in Hebrew is the numerical value of the word chesed, God's loving kindness. Because the ultimate example of God's loving kindness was God sending his son to die and to suffer and to raise from the dead. The ultimate display. The world is founded on kindness. And that's why literally the world is founded on the redemptive sacrifice of Jesus and this is what the book of Revelation is talking about he is the lamb what slain before the foundation of the world that is the foundation of the world the Messiah's promise to bring life and transformation and the resurrection Right, as good as, as beautiful as the death is, if he would have stayed in the tomb, it wouldn't mean anything. But the resurrection, Paul says our hope would have been in vain. But the, but the resurrection of Messiah means that we move from death 
to life, from darkness to light, from healing to wholeness and transformation. And this is a season of life where God is breathing new life and bringing transformation. There was a famous rabbi, and one day he was teaching his disciples, and all of a sudden they began to fall asleep, and he made this statement. He said, let Esther, who was, he said, he asked, he asked, he said this, what did Esther perceive that enabled her to rule over 127 provinces, which it talks about in the book of Esther? He said, let Esther, who was a descendant of the matriarch Sarah, who lived 127 years, come and rule over 127 provinces. So why had his students lost interest and what caused them to regain interest by by making this connection between 127 provinces that that was ruled over in the book of Esther and the 127 years that Sarah lived? What was the connection? And it's understood that the rabbi was calling them to achieve what was beyond their ability to accomplish. They had lost interest because they felt they could not reach the lofty goal spiritually that they were being called to. So Esther was able to rise to a lofty state because she aspired to reach the spiritual level of Sarah who lived 127 years because of her love and her commitment to serve the Lord. And although Esther did not reach the same level of Sarah her efforts to want to become like this great woman of faith. This is what Hebrews 11 talks about. This great testimony of witnesses, this great cloud of witnesses is there to spur us on, to inspire us that we should become like them. That Hebrews chapter 11 in the Bible is finished, but you know what? In heaven it's not. And where do we should want to become one of those spiritual champions. And she wanted to become like Sarah. One of the the founding mother of faith was Abraham. And she, God blessed her with royalty and the opportunity to save her people. Just as an aside, with 127, Malibu, I've been told, is one mile wide and 27 miles long. (laughs) Interesting. But the point here is that if one does aspire to reach audacious goals, you cannot achieve anything great or reach your full potential if you don't desire to reach to become great for God, to become great for the Lord. We have to aim high. We have to set the bar high, which will cause us to go further than we ever would otherwise. If we aim low, there is nowhere to go. Say that. If we aim low... There's nowhere to go. If you don't aspire to do great things, you're going to settle for mediocrity. Jesus didn't die so we could be mediocre. He died so that we can display his majesty and his glory. And when Moses encountered God at the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3, this is what it says. Then he, then he said, God said, do not draw back. Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off of your feet for the place you are standing is what? Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Abraham, Yaakov, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And there's two different opinions. Was Moses hiding his face a good thing or a not so good thing? Some say Moses was blessed for hiding his face because it was a sign of his what? Humility. And as a result of his humility, some say, of hiding his face, his face shone with the kavod, the glory of God, when he came down the mountain with the tablets of God on Mount Sinai. And think about it for a moment. There are angels in heaven known as seraphim, and then uh, Isaiah chapter 6 talks about them. They have how many wings? Six wings, two to cover their face, two to cover their feet, and two to fly with. It's like Moses covered his face, take off your shoes. The sense of humility before the presence and the majesty of God. And we've talked about this before. Humility is occupying the right amount of space. Not occupying too much, not occupying too little. Some say Moses was punished 
or not fully blessed because when he was asked to see his face, he didn't want to see it. And as a result, he only got to see the back of God. Exodus 34, when, he's, when God goes before him, he says, you can see my goodness, you can see my back. And some say it was right for him to cover his face. The issue wasn't that he wanted to cover his face, that was good in humility, but some say he was afraid and that he didn't even want to look. And the lesson that we learn here is that even though we might not be ready for certain encounters and opportunities, and it might be wise not to take them, we still need to aspire to achieve them. If we truly see value in a goal, we must seek to obtain it no matter how hard, how high, or how difficult it might be. And the very act of reaching, the very act of going after it, transforms us and pushes us to reach our full potential and causes us to go further than we ever would have otherwise. And during this season of counting, we have to realize that we all have unreached potential that we need to go after. During the counting of the Omer, this, this offering that was offered, we must aspire to achieve greater levels of transformation and potential. And if we're ever to ascend to the highest levels of growth and calling that we were created to, we must begin with the end in mind or we're going to fall way short. Because God sees in you more than you could ever see in yourself. And there was a great teacher who was completely illiterate, and he fell in love with his boss's wife, and, he, and she, said, I, she said, I'm not going to marry an ignoramus. She goes, I, I, if you don't know the word of God, if you're not studied, if you're not learned, I'm not going to marry you. And he says, I'm 40 years old. How can I ever begin to learn? Wait, 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 but wait, wait, wait. His, what, his boss's wife or daughter? Boss's daughter, sorry. <laughs> boss's daughter, boss's daughter. <laughs> Clarify that. Thank you. Got carried away there. Not good. <laughs> Wanted to marry his boss's daughter. He was, he was illiterate shepherd. Got to see if you're on your toes there. And he lived in Israel. And he began to go and study the alphabet began to study one book, another book, and he became one of the greatest scholars ever. All because this woman saw something in him that he couldn't see in himself. Something beautiful, something wonderful. She saw a potential in him that he couldn't see, and the Lord sees a potential in you that oftentimes you can't see. You know, I heard this... Uh, funny story yesterday. Uh, I was at the wedding of, of uh, Pastor Cheon's son, Gabe, to Monica, and he opened the, 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 the charge like this. He said, when I, he said, when I was, I had, a, I had a fight with my wife one day, and uh, I said, she he said, honey, I, the Lord is, because I don't understand why the Lord has made you so beautiful yet stupid. <laughs> and she turned around and said, I think it was a joke, but she turned around and said, he made me, he made me, he made, he made me beautiful that you, so you'd want to marry me, and he made me stupid so I'd marry you. <laughs> <laughs> and the truth is, sometimes we're not smart enough to see what God sees in us. But there's something there. There's something that God wants to spark. He took these 12 disciples, he took a nation of slaves, and he transformed them, and he made something significant out of them. We don't talk, we still talking about these 12 guys thousands of years later. We're still talking, we don't talk about the Egyptians, we don't talk about these ancient peoples, we're still talking about what God did through his chosen people. 
We all know the stories of people that are trapped by heavy objects and their desires to get out. They find the superhuman strength to lift up and to break out. And if we truly want something bad enough and we believe God has called us to it, there's no telling what it is that we can accomplish. I mean, growing up, I wanted my dream in life was to play for UNC, University of North Carolina, to get a basketball scholarship. You know, even if it meant riding the bench, it was okay. And uh, I went from being the worst basketball player to being one of the better basketball players on my team. But part of the reason is I had a coach that believed in me. And he pushed me and he drove me to become the best that I could be. And if we cry out to God and we trust him, we have to understand that aspiration has to be accompanied by action. There's a man who wanted to win the lottery, and he prayed to God every day, and he went to heaven. He said, Lord, why didn't you let me win the lottery? I was so faithful. I prayed. And the Lord said to him, well, you need, why didn't you buy a ticket? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we can't expect to get anywhere. We need the aspiration without perspiration will leave you wanting. And these days of counting the days between the, the, the first fruits and Pentecost, it's not enough to count the days. What it says is we have to make every day count. It's for this reason why we count up and not down to the giving of the word, to the giving of the spirit. The goal is important, but it can't be reached unless we use our time and our talent wisely each day. So we talk about this season as being a season of freedom. One of the greatest signs of freedom, one of the greatest aspects of freedom is the ability to choose how to use your time. Slaves work hard, but many of you work hard too. The difference is one is working because they have to. When you work hard, it's because you want to, because you have a purpose and a passion. And Rachel has a son, she names him Joseph, Joseph, and she says, and it says this, and she conceived and bore a son, and God has taken away my reproach, so she called his, his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me a son, another son, Joseph Lee ben Acher, God give me another son, it's an interesting response, instead of being thankful for Joseph, this beautiful baby, she says, God give me another son. Although she had an amazing son, a beautiful son, she couldn't have kids, and here was a son. What did she say? She says, God, I want more. And when it comes to matters of spiritual things, we should always want more. We're called to go from glory to glory. We're called to multiply what we've been given. We're called to strengthen what has been put in our hands. And we're either growing or dying, and there is no in-between. And in matters of spirituality, and in matters of holiness, we always are called to ascend and not descend and this is a key to transformation and at this season we have to examine our lives we have to look into our hearts and we have to ask ourselves how am i doing in this area of spiritual growth how am i going in this desire and passion for the kingdom seek first the kingdom of god and all these things will be added unto me do we have the desire do we have the heart and even setbacks and advantages can be used for our benefit and, our perp and for greater blessings. The descent for the sake of ascent. We can have lofty goals and dreams. We need to be realistic where we are right now. We can't live in denial. We have to aim high. We have to want to see our families achieve great things. We, have to be, we must be careful in the process. Because we all know those crazy parents who push their kids and wind up burning them out. Holding high expectations. God loves and accepts us for where we are, but he wants us to go further. And this is how a father deals with a son. A father always wants his son to go further, to go higher, to be better than where he's been and what he's done. And our responsibility is to go as far as we can. And our responsibility is to help encourage others and push them to go as far as they can. You can't say you love someone and leave them for where they're at. Love pushes us and spurs us on, but in the right spirit. 
And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you little by little, and you will be in, in you, and he will enable you to dest- not to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. What we learn from Israel taking the land is the same way God wants us to grow and to proceed. It has to happen slowly. If you detox too quickly, you'll poison your body. We need to be like him. Growth and transformation has to be done at the right pace. And everyone is different. And that's why we need spiritual mentors in our lives. And the counting of the days between uh, Passover and Pentecost represent the desire and the need to aspire to spiritual growth and transformation. And the interesting thing is everyone must count individually. No one can count for you. Listen, I wish someone could work out for me. It doesn't happen that way, right? You have to do the hard work. You have to count. You have to make the time count. You must do the work add day by day, adding a little by little. And each step we take towards the Lord, each step we take towards the goal, God ultimately transforms us and changes us. And it's the sum total of all the little things that you do that ultimately, in the end, counts and changes you and transforms you. And I know, some of the, I know one of the big mistakes I sometimes make is I sometimes want to be that Hail Mary type of guy. I want the big play. I want the big thing. And understanding it's the daily discipline of walking with God, of spending time with him, of being faithful, of hearing his voice, of doing what he asks. It's that daily being faithful in the little things. It's doing the small things each day that ultimately will determine the way our life goes and the impact that we have. And as we've shared before, the counting reminds us that transformation, redemption, revelation, encounter, spiritual growth is a process. And although we might have a promise from God, you have to go through the process. There are no shortcuts to get from Egypt to Sinai. There's no shortcuts for Jesus. Father, take this cup from me. Man, the resurrection would have been great, but it couldn't have done it without the cross. The enemy came and tempted him and said, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world Just bow down to me. He was offering him a shortcut in the process minus the pain. But it's in the midst of the process, in the midst of the pain, in the midst of the loss, in the midst of going through all of this, that is ultimately what changes you and transform you. And we're so ends orientated that we don't understand. It is the means that God uses That's the most important. If you could memorize every spiritual truth, every book of the Bible, but all it was was rote information and knowledge to you, it wouldn't change you one bit. When in the midst of your situations and circumstances, you read the word and you hear God speaking to you in the midst of it, then the scripture becomes alive for you and you see yourself in the context of what's written on the page being played out in your life and then it becomes living and active and it changes you. But it's in the midst of the process of the wrestling that God changes us. And transforms us and sanctifies us and conforms us to his image and his likeliness. So I want to encourage you guys. We heard this amazing story from, from, from Terry and what the girls went through. And you know what this says? It says, you know what? Make it count. Make it count. The life that you've been given, make it count. Jesus died for you so that your life could count. He died for you and went through all that, that your life might matter. So we don't throw it away. We thank him for it, and we go do something awesome as a result. And that is the greatest way to show our thanks to him. So Abba, we just want to thank you. We just want to worship you. We just want to lift up the name of your son. 
And we just want to ask that this season where you taught your disciples the meaning of the kingdom, as we begin this journey over the next few weeks of preparing ourselves for Pentecost, we just want to ask that you'd open our hearts, that you'd turn our hearts towards heaven. And that you'd begin to change us. That you'd begin to allow us to hear your voice and to know you in new ways. We thank you, God, for what you did for Terry, for Lauren, for Megan. We thank you that there was something amazing that you have planned for them in their lives, a purpose beyond their comprehension. And the same is true for each one of us. Help us to pursue it. Help us to be changed by it. In the name of your son, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Would you bring restoration? Bring restoration. Bring restoration into my soul. And you bring restoration. You bring restoration.
thank you that redemption is not a one-time event. That redemption is a process of transformation where we become in reality what we are in actuality. Where we become like your son in every way because when we see you, we shall be like you. And so we ask, God, that you who began that work of redemption in our lives, God, that that justification leads to sanctification and sanctification to glorification. And we just want to ask God, take us through that process in a new way at that, if it's a season. And bring your presence to walk us through that process that something more glorious might result. So we bless your name. We thank you. We lift up the name of your son this week. Seat us with him in heavenly places above the fray. So we bless you now. We thank you for this day that we can worship you. We honor you in the name of your son, Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. And we ask, God, that what you did in Terry's life will be a first fruits of what you're going to do in the lives of many here in Malibu. So we bless you now in the name of your son. Amen. Amen. It's great to see you all. We have the prayer team. If you need prayer, if you need encouragement, if you need some transformation, turn to your neighbor, give him a hug, say hey. Have a great week.